Welcome everyone. So today this actually this event is being organized on behalf of Kodi Almunai Association uh, by Didi Bahini and from Kodi itself. So today, okay, go ahead, Tony. Over to you. Okay, so um, uh, basically, um, as, as somebody has already asked, uh, you know, so exactly what's the purpose of, the, of this conversation today? So uh, we're all dealing with a very complicated situation, and um, and we've been hearing back at uh, the Cody Institute from our graduates uh, around the world, some of them uh, reporting on what they're doing in the response to the um, uh, pandemic, and some of them asking, what should we be doing? And so uh, these are... Um, where we started convening these conversations with different networks of graduates um, uh, with the um, uh, um, uh, graduates of different courses, graduates of di from different countries, graduates from different um, programs, and getting people together um, to talk about uh, what's happening. So it's really primarily an opportunity to share ideas and experiences and, and questions and challenges. Uh, this is not a, a lecture format and not a webinar. We're not saying that this is the right way to do it. This isn't a course. Uh, this is um, largely a, uh, a conversation, as we framed it, a community conversation whereby we can share experiences, ask questions. Uh, from uh, our site at Cody, we've, we've been hearing back from different graduates around the world. Uh, we know that every country is different um, in terms of the uh, the context of the pandemic um, uh, and the response of government and civil society. So it's just our attempt to try to foster that conversation and to take away uh, lessons learned. Okay. <clears throat> and next one, Eileen, please. <clears throat> okay, so um, the way we thought we'd do it today, and we're looking at about an hour's conversation, we think, is just very quickly to set the scene uh, about what's happening. Uh, both globally and in Nepal, and then just ask the question, uh, be, uh, which is really rooted in our whole approach as the Annie Ganesh movement and the Cody Institute and your uh, development organizations, which is what does a response uh, to COVID-19 look like if we think it should be community driven, okay, uh, citizen based, asset based or whatever. So what would that mean? And it might, <coughs> sorry, it may involve Issues of outreach and education. How do we how do we reach out to communities in these circumstances? Uh, it may mean particularly working with vulnerable groups, be that women or seniors or youth or the poor or the marginalized. Uh, it may mean speaking to specific issues uh, that may be food security or livelihoods or health. Uh, I suspect some of us are dealing with issues. What does it mean for our own organization? I mean, certainly it means something for the, uh, the community and the people uh, that we work with. But to be honest, this lockdown, this shutdown can have huge implications for us as our own organizations. And so what are we thinking about the sustainability uh, and, the, um, and the capacities of our own organizations to survive uh, and to be effective um, members of the community? And finally, uh, of course, there are public policy issues. Our governments are doing some, making some major decisions <clears throat> about uh, public policy, just the lockdown itself, and then some uh, aid uh, that is being done or not being done, uh, some exceptions that are being done, some support for different sectors or different community groups. Do we as civil society have anything to say to government on this? to push them or pull them <clears throat> or try to influence them in one way or another, or maybe just to try and hold them to account uh, for what they're doing. So these are all the types of questions or issues we're hearing from uh, uh, development partners and Cody graduates around the world. And we just want to hear and, uh, what you're thinking, what you're doing, uh, what you're saying, and that. Uh, and then at the end, we can have a little chat, which is a helpful chat. And uh, where do we want to take this from here, both within Nepal and at the Cody Institute? So that's really our agenda for the day, really. <clears throat> Hi. So Tony and I will be, sorry, Tony, I, I'm, I'm so spontaneously saying Tony. I'm, I'm not used to Anthony. Anthony. It's fine. It's okay. fine. So we're, we're all used to it. So sorry. That's uh, all right. So both of us will be facilitating uh, the process, um, but with a very, very 
I mean, efficient um, technological support and facilitation back to screen by Eileen and Shuran. Thank you, Shuran. I would also like to introduce here that we are a panel of four, and there are some other technical support also who's back in, um, in the screen supporting us. So this time we would like to end, I mean, acknowledge and encourage everyone to share. It's nice to see that there are already 22 participants here. Welcome everyone. So meantime, we'll be sharing a little bit in the formal way and then we will we'll open up for open floor discussion. Then. <clears throat> we know that slide is Beauty and the Beast, but we won't go there. Okay, so um, uh, just quickly on the Cody Institute. Um, you all know it. I, I believe every, all the names I've seen come up are all Cody graduates, so it's an all unknown quantity. Uh, you know about our background rooted in the anti Ganesh movement, um, the uh, leadership education programs that we run on campus, and then um, all the uh, follow up work that we do off campus um, and increasingly online as we move forward. Uh, in case if uh, you're wondering, if you haven't seen, um, the Institute has been obliged because of the pandemic to, um, uh, to uh, shut down operations through the summer. Uh, so we had to cancel the diploma program that was uh, due to start, um, what, in, in two weeks time. Um, uh, and a whole series of certificates over the course of the summer. Uh, we rescheduled the certificates into the, into the um, uh, uh, oh, we also canceled or postponed till next year the uh, the Global Change Leaders uh, program, and the certificates we've we've rescheduled into the fall, and so we're hopeful that they will still take place. But uh, we will see how this whole um, uh, process uh, works out. So we've had to make major changes to our program, and as you can see from our backgrounds, we also are in lockdown and are all working from home these days. Okay, Eileen. So, okay, the next. Okay. Over to you, Saloni, for this, I think. So, uh, you, okay, thank you very much. We, Kodi and Nepal, has, uh, we, we've been having a long relationship, as you know, since after 10 years, or, or I mean, since 1960s. Uh, Participants from Nepal have been participating in Kodi. Uh, so we have graduates for 40 years um, with us in Nepal. So it has been a great experience working with and learning from Kodi. It is a community uh, itself. So we've been meeting almost every alternate years as graduates and whenever we have Anybody from Cody, we try to make sure that we are together and we share. So this is this is the first time we are organizing webinar, and I think this is also an opportunity for, for us to learn that we don't need to be virtually together to meet. If we really want to meet, we also can have this type of uh, virtual meetings. So um, this time. Um, we invited all of our um, graduates. We tried. Tony has been sending all the email, extending all, and there were the, we also tried from different different uh, mediums. Therefore, we hope that we have all the members together, and at least they have they have, we we could reach them with the information. So even though all of them could not participate participate here in this meeting, I mean, they couldn't connect through, but I, I hope that they will be, they are there uh, together with us. So welcome everyone. Thank you, Cody, also for, for connecting with us and giving this opportunity for everyone to be together as Cody family. So, so I don't want to read how many members we have. We have almost, we are more than 150 members and we try to reach out everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, that's all by way of background um, to, the, to the webinar, um, to the conversation. 
Uh, now let's get into the meat of the matter, and it really is around the, um, the pandemic. So um, uh, very quickly, um, uh, at the global level, um, uh, you know, this arose in uh, December, January, uh, the, the identified or given the label of COVID-19 as a highly contagious and, and very dangerous, particularly for those with diminished immune systems. So a lot of vulnerable people in all our societies. Um, and in only a few months, it spread around the world, uh, infecting over 2 million people uh, and killing almost uh, 200,000. I think it's 180,000 is the official reports. And of course, these are the official statistics and every um, uh, epidemiologist and every specialist is saying, in fact, the numbers are, all, are, are most likely much higher um, because of uh, the lack of testing capacity and, and, and that and tracking capacity. So the numbers are almost certainly much higher. And so this, um, this concern, particularly around the um, mortality rates and the uh, contagious nature of the infection rates, has prompted a, 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 a almost global shutdown uh, of economic, political and social life. Uh, and this is uh, this started in January in China and and continues in uh, most of our part uh, most of the rest of the world um, to this day, and this is having huge um, impact. Some are arguing that the lockdown is itself. Oh, no sound. Uh, uh, Tony, you're breaking. Your voice is breaking. Anthony, you're cutting out. It's on the Nepali context. Okay. So in Nepal also, as the pandemic started in January, so there was a huge group of students who were studying in Wuhan and uh, government rescued them by, after a few weeks, uh, weeks and among them, when when all the students arrived, they were put in isolation, and we found one was a, um, <clears throat> one infected uh, person. Until third uh, and third week of March, we had only one, uh, and who also recovered very soon. But after March, third week, we we had we started uh, to have some more who came from Europe. And then until last week, it was very low. I mean, it was eight, nine, ten. We were, we, we, we didn't have that much, um, I mean, multiplied infected people. But recently, it really went very high up. Now, up to now, to up to the date, it is about 42 uh, infected cases. Government has been very, I mean, efficiently locking down. It started lockdown when we uh, we got the second infected person and started tracking, uh, tracing, treating, and also following up. Uh, so far, we we only have 42, but it's very alarming that there so there might be many more so testing tracing uh, work is going on very well at this time let's hope that it will not go as bad there is also a, a um, statistical um, slide which suran has made very efficiently up to that you can see this we have 40 uh, 40 infected uh, person in the hospitals among them, 79% are male and 21%, and it has been distributed in all different um, uh, provinces. And now suddenly, within a week, the bar went up, very suited up in the province number one, which is alarming now. So we need to be very, very careful now. The lockdown, we have been locked down for three weeks. We don't know whether it will be losing next week or whether we should be open next week or not. But this is a very alarming situation. From first stage, we have just went up to the second stage. And this is uh, very, I mean, we need to be very conscious about this. And if we can, 
control at this phase, that will be a huge big win for Nepal. Therefore, we need to really think now, this is the right time that we're gathering together and start thinking and coming up with some, uh, some innovative, creative, preventive measures um, right now. Therefore, I welcome everyone to think about it and discuss on. So among us, there are some friends who are already, who, who are working specifically on different thematic um, issues. Uh, shall I invite some of our friends who are now prepared to share on some specific themes? Eileen, are you ready? Can I invite some of the participants who, have, who, who agree to share for two minutes each? Yeah, that's fine. Now, Jaya, um, or sorry, Jaya um, is one of those. I don't, and I also see Rupa online. I don't see Bumi online, um, but which would you like Mukesh, to start with? Mukesh is online. Mukesh, Rupa, and Jaya. Okay. I didn't see also Bumi online. May I invite uh, Jaya first to share on what is the situation of women, children, and how it's the the uh, situation of gender based violence uh, in in the state of uh, i mean <clears throat> lockdown Zaya, yeah. yes good evening everyone uh, this is uh, good evening i'm saying this because it is we are from nepal now uh, this is jaya luintel from nepal if there are uh, other participants from uh, around the world uh, definitely, I have been uh, listening from uh, Anthony and, and Saloni Didi, and Saloni Didi has already uh, provided update uh, on Nepal's situation in COVID-19. And I'll be sharing more detail on the, on the, on the rise of um, gender-based violence cases, uh, particularly when women are locked down uh, within their home, and home apparently is the um, most unsafe space for uh, women in most of the uh, places around the world and it is same in uh, Nepal as well. So um, there have been, uh, there have been uh, rising in the cases of gender-based violence, particularly domestic violence cases are in the rise in, in Nepal. Uh, and in the situation of COVID um, uh, pandemic, it is even difficult, uh, it is very difficult for us uh, to uh, trace what is happening uh, in, in different and rural part of uh, Nepal. And there are some community uh, volunteers who are also providing psychosocial counseling support uh, via phone, via telephone conversation to the people who are facing different kind of uh, violence uh, uh, at their home. And the situation is totally different uh, than other times because in other times in the cases of gender-based violence and and violence against women, women were asked to come out of their home and then uh, they were encouraged to go out and seek support and also do the reporting. But now the government is saying that, you know, you stay at home. So that means the perpetrators are also uh, getting it as, um, as, a, as an opportunity, taking it as an opportunity and uh, they are also perpetrating uh, more violence to, to women. And there is also another scenario um, uh, on the service delivery part where uh, there are some services, but not like uh, before because the hospitals, there are some, um, there are, there are some services uh, focused on uh, gender-based violence, to respond gender-based violence, but those hospitals are now providing support to, um, support to the um, virus uh, affected uh, people and th those are being planned like that. So women are also not getting uh, support and when they go to the police for uh, filing the case and reporting and police has also you know said to them that now we are so busy in responding COVID uh, pandemic so uh, come after like two weeks. So that is the situation that is uh, going on. Uh, the, the challenge is this, but there are also, as Anthony at first, you know, mentioned about how the communities are utilizing uh, the assets they have in their community. There are also some women's group uh, which are making masks in their community by mobilizing the women's group and then and uh, handing it over to the local uh, governments as well. And there are some women's group with whom, with which Story Kitchen has been working. They are 
distributing soap and some locally made hand uh, sanitizers because they produce alcohol in their communities and they are just you know making uh, making local sanitizers out of that and they are distributing uh, particularly in the rural part of nepal where all these uh, all these uh, accessories are uh, not available uh, and story kitchen has also uh, started um, uh, to particularly to reach out to the more vulnerable population and uh, and as we work on the stories uh, of women we also decided to reach out to the women who are in the vulnerable situation and whose stories are actually not being covered by the mainstream media so we have started this facebook uh, page we call it katha corona it is uh, in it is in nepali because we we just wanted to reach out to all nepalis uh, readers and audience so basically it is the stories of uh, corona uh, but it is uh, more focusing on the women and those from the vulnerable groups and uh, and we are just you know talking via phone and getting their photos and just publishing it so that the stories of uh, the stories and the situation of those who are vulnerable can be amplified and that can be taken into the policy advocacy as well uh, and and this is this situation is really very uncertain we yet don't know what is going to happen and we all are locked down uh, and this is also a good time for us to reflect back upon how privileged uh, we are um, some of the people like you know how people how privileged we are and and there has been also some meetings we are organizing uh, with the women in community and and it is also good to see how women are using the technology at least at least to reach out to each other and talk about the situation and come up with some strategies on how they can support provide support to others who are really in need Uh, so this has also given us some space to uh, to recognize our privilege but utilizing those privilege to uh, to support uh, others and be to be more empathetic to others who don't have access to the food uh, who don't have access to all these resources and even who don't have access to all these information you know access to zoom or or facebook messenger or viber so it is also uh, in terms of uh, you know if we look into it from a positive side it has also given us some opportunities uh, to look into the privilege that we carry but how we can utilize that privilege to support um, other people who are uh, really in vulnerable uh, situation thank, thank you, you thank you jaya uh, let's save something for later so um tony shall we go on with the question and then give give opportunity for others to speak or what do we do uh, they, let you're doing fine i, I mean uh, the questions uh, i mean uh, the questions are just up there for discussion starters i think the input for participants is fine so uh, if uh, eileen can maybe move us along we have different types of questions as i mentioned different themes but uh, i think yeah. we just uh, Move along and hear from the participants. Yeah. Okay, right now or okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. You're doing fine, Salami. Okay, so so as we have some people who have also prepared to to about so our input and community engagement and how has been the uh, the response. Uh, we would um, we would I would like to invite Mukesh Singh, who has been with Red Cross for a long time, and also he's been in the engagement and dialogue with the government on these issues. May I invite you, Mukesh Ji, for two minutes to speak on Mukesh? Are you here? Thank you, Salunidhi. Yes, I am here. Namaste, all. Be brief and specific, okay? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you. Namaste, all. Uh, this is Mukesh Singh, Kodi graduate, uh, 1998. Uh, I work for International Federation of Red Cross now in Kathmandu. Uh, based on what I discussed with Salendi, I'll just give you brief, uh, like what uh, in terms of response and preparedness we are doing for. As this is a global things and pandemic, so as an international federation, and we have a Red Cross Red Crescent movement. It's called ICRC, the National Society, and then IFRC. uh every country 192 uh, country we are having our national society so we are active in across the globe all 192 country uh, we are we have been appealing for 800 million across the world to respond to this uh, 
COVID, and I think most probably will exceed that uh, uh, appeal, and it is going uh, well. Uh, so at this moment in, in, in Nepal, we have a small team of international federation who is working with Nepal Red Cross, supporting Nepal Red Cross in terms of responding to this uh, COVID-related uh, crisis or pandemic at this stage. Uh, there are a number of areas, I think, as, uh, as, uh, as many of you know, that Nepal Red Cross is an auxiliary to the government and whatever we do is uh, in, in line with the government policy and guidelines. So greater kind of a strong relationship and coordination mechanism, mechanism, especially with Ministry of Health and Population. They have the operation center and our people is coordinating with them, I think, every day and uh, response is coordinated well uh, from the district chapter also. What we do, I think it is all 77 districts, they are active in different ways. The most important part is engaging with community uh, in terms of creating awareness and listening to them and addressing to their issues. People have several questions, dilemma and confusion, some sort of stress, uh, like what is going to happen in the future. Everybody know Corona, Corona, and everybody is kind of panic at the same time. So one of the important duty of Red Cross is to try to create some awareness to the community through different IEC materials and through the miking. And Red Cross volunteers are sitting at the several help desks across the country and providing their support. And at the same time, uh, through the radio, we have a Nepal Red Cross also have their own uh, radio program the hotline and from there also lots of messaging uh, as part of our community engagement strategy is uh, uh, allowed to the people and at the same time uh, we have this 1130 number the hotline number where people are uh, asking every day several questions and there are a team responding to their questions and whatever message we pass actually it is uh, very much aligned with what ministry of health guided by who is uh, supporting uh, providing to us so based on that, these are, these are the main area that uh, uh, we are really looking at. At the same time, at this moment, I think big discussion is going on in terms of like uh, there had been much less, I think government is trying to do, but one of the biggest problem with the migrants workers who have been uh, suffering, I think they were kind of daily wages and they were very much dependent on their daily wages and which is, uh, kind of, is, which is not possible at this moment. They are not getting much on that. Uh, so there are lots of people displacing from Kathmandu and across the country, lots of people is stranded across the border. So there are some discussion going on. Now we are not, as a primary concern, we are not trying to focus on food and so many things. We're trying to work together with government and the quarantine sites in many places and also trying, district chapter are now trying to address like how to display, how to address the issues of the migrants, especially at this on the temporary basis. So there are some initiative happening, more discussion is going on what to do, uh, do for those peoples. Uh, but then in terms of normal activity, like uh, emergency operation center, Nepal Red Cross also has, this has been activated and they are working closely with the government. Uh, there are a uh, uh, number of awareness campaigns across the country, especially on community orientation at the schools and door to door. Uh, through miking and through the help decks. And of course, this uh, education is through different flyers and stickers, as I say, IEC material. Uh, at the same time, we are also ensuring that our volunteer and staff are well protected with uh, protective device, not to the complete set, but at least masks and gloves are in some places where uh, people are uh, involved directly in the quarantine sites or somewhere, then they have the, uh, the hazmat suit or the gown or so on. So volunteer is the key part of that. So, and then Mr. hygiene Excuse me, Mukesh, may I interrupt just to ask uh, one question that's coming from the uh, participants. Um, one, uh, Charles has asked what, that some community are blocking or putting up barriers for, for people to return. Um, and so there's a concern around family reunification. And is there, is there something in specifically that could be managed around that? Uh, do you have any suggestions? Yeah, this is very valid questions and of course uh, Nepal Red Cross would love to do that, but this is something like a government political decision and something even the even the court has high court has given some decision, but then at the prime minister level, I think in terms of uh, um, 
ensuring that people reaches to their destination, not only from Kathmandu to other districts, but there are also people trying to come to Kathmandu because their hometown is Kathmandu. And more than that is the people are standing at border and waiting across the globe. So this is at this moment, Nepal Red Cross is not able to do anything. Of course, when the situation permits and government issues some sort of uh, flexibility on that, then definitely this is one of the area that Nepal Red Cross can also look at. Yeah, so I just- Thank just you, to, thank you. Thank yeah. you, Moke. Okay, thanks. Can you go? Thank you very much. Um, now, I would like to invite, I mean, we are going to talk about some vulnerable groups. Next slide, uh, Eileen. So when we talk about vulnerable groups, there's many other vulnerable groups, but the youth, youth bulge in Nepal is a huge, big population. So we have um, among us is, is one of the youth, National Youth Council member who, who, who can share about what has been, uh, what, what are the policies and what has been doing for youth, uh, in Nepal. So I would like to invite Rupa, Rupa Preti, uh, to, to share us about the situation of youth and what are the policies now, what, what are the strategies that uh, has been uh, in the disc discussion in Nepal. Rupa. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Welcome, Rupa. Uh, uh, hello. Thank you, Sarah Ridvi, and, uh, and hi to all. All of you. Uh, yeah, uh, as regarding the youth context in Nepal, uh, yeah, youth population is high, and then whatever migration issues and all those all goes for the uh, belong for the youth. However, like I just checked with the government, uh, government also has not uh, concrete plan, but at least uh, recently the few weeks back, the ministry has uh, brought up uh, uh, youth mobilization guidelines. Uh, but due to this uh, uh, situation uh, and the lockdown situation, this has been not at implemented, but they are planning to implement it with uh, precaution of or following with uh, some guideline with uh, WHO to the Central level to the municipalities and then very VDC level uh, to um, to mobilize those youth for the, um, the support of certain community. And I also check with NYC some guideline and then now government has also uh, preparation or discussion going on for the next year budget because this uh, June July the uh, Nepal government has to bring. Um, new budget also. So more or less, uh, current context, the whole budget has been, uh, whatever remains, they have been like stopped, especially with the ministries and, and National Youth Council budget to respond to the corona uh, for the year, this crisis, to address this crisis. And also the government, like especially uh, the uh, the planning and then uh, the Ministry of uh, Economy, uh, what is what is called I forgot particularly, uh, Economy, uh, Earth Mantrale, uh, Ministry of Finance. Ah, uh, yeah, Ministry of Finance. That has been uh, like calling several meeting and then uh, like uh, suggest to all the ministry that uh, brought up like and plan bring some plan to address post corona or like coming years, uh, some plan uh, regarding the employment opportunity to address the, uh, you know, migrant or like to uh, migrant youth or like uh, potential, you know, areas to uh, do some productive, uh, productive, uh, uh, what is called like entrepreneurship, employed, uh, employment generation opportunity so they all are they also don't have much plan but so each ministry has already uh, given like uh, like you know guidelines uh, to to some sort of bring go, uh, with those plans so now they are also preparing to address how we can um, coming this ahead to address those uh, huge um, 
unemployment issues in Nepal. Maybe, maybe particularly, maybe the our uh, one of potential area is agriculture, and they are seeking other options also. But at the very moment, they are just you know collecting the ideas and they're preparing for the next budget. And then at the current moment, also as a National Youth Council and the ministry also, they have uh, prepared and then they call the volunteers, uh, volunteers uh, for the youth. Um, what is called like forms, and then and and near future they are going to you know uh, involve uh, those youth for the community development. But this is just for the post crisis or after the lockdown plan. But immediate action plan they just doing wh whoever are involved or like associate with the national youth council network, like entrepreneur group or like NGO affiliated group. They are also doing some support with the. National Youth Council uh, to like first like psycho a little bit about psycho social council also uh, a little bit about awareness also and then uh, the implement group they have do, doing some help with their access to supply chain also with uh, uh, with uh, keeping those my uh, keeping the mind about like pre their precaution and safety and then supplying and then rescue thing also. So uh, and so far, and government also like trying to do some uh, uh, that relief things, but like uh, uh, as already like some of our friends has already mentioned about our situation, day by day it is going to uh, be increased and it is not so sufficient. So in a brief like situation is that it's not like that like according to uh, government plan and policy they are thinking that like how our youth use of youth population can be taken it into as opportunity in future days ahead to national building or like let's say community development process to join him together hello yeah, I think yes, uh, okay. basically I have done right moment, but later on, if like some questions and queries, I will be definitely back. Thank you, thank you, Rupa, very much. So among the other vulnerable people, there are so many other vulnerable groups also. Um, please, all uh, friends, you think about it, and whenever you have any input, you just we will be discussing on on the open floor. The next issue we have is food. So we 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 try to discuss with our friends. Actually, Bumi Bumi wanted to share about his research on labor migrants, issues of the labor migrants and other marginalized group. I think he's not arrived yet, so let's keep it up for, um, for later. So Saloni G, um, there's a, a suggestion in the chat box that maybe Sarita G could add a little bit more um, information. Also, I believe around gender-based violence responses. Do you have a? Do we have a moment for that as well? Tony, what do you think? I think we should um, give an opportunity to Sarita. I was also reading about it. Um, Sarita, try to be brief and also um, include a little bit of other marginalized groups uh, like different vulnerable groups. It's over to you, Sarita. Sarita Ji. We couldn't hear you, Eileen. Sorry about that. I said that uh, I'm unmuting Sarita G so that she should be able to speak. Oh, she says that her yes. mic is yes. not working. Uh, can you try again? Sarita, can you try again one more time? I, I have made sure that you're unmuted. Okay, she's, she needs another five minutes. I also see that, uh, unfortunately, Boomi doesn't have proper internet connection today. Um, so perhaps we can continue on and we can bring Sarita G on later on. 
Okay. So next. So our next issue is on food security, livelihood issues, health, which most of our previous speakers have already highlighted. And then the issue that we will very much be discussing about our own issues, that is our organizational issues, sustainability of the organization that we represent, food security, um, in this food security, livelihood and health, what can be done to address the immediate food security needs of the poor? We really need to think about it. It's not just two, four, five weeks of lockdown, after lockdown, post lockdown, post corona um, uh, is one of the biggest challenge that we will be facing. The whole globe will be facing, but we in Nepal will be facing more harshly. Therefore, we need to think about it, and I would like all our friends to, dis to, to think about it and share about it. <clears throat> and then next, can you go to the next? So, yeah, so our, so as, Don, as Anthony has already expressed that Many of our lives have been threatened, and at the same time, many of the of uh, our organization who we belong to are also facing a lot when we are in lockdown situation. So, what what do we think about this? How can we uh, think about our own self sustainability? What will be the future of our, of our community work? community mobilization, community empowerment programs. We really need to uh, discuss things and act upon this. What can our organization do to, do to ensure we continue the work that we have been doing on our own? So this is another challenge that, uh, that we really need to think and discuss on. Then, uh, then at the last policy, how can we, uh, we contribute to the policy framework? How do we advocate for the policy? These, these are the questions that we have in our list. We would like our friends to contribute and discuss on how can we influence policy? Um, since I have also been in many different uh, national and international networks of NGOs, CBOs, and, uh, and different thematic groups, um, NGO Federation of Nepal has been discussing on this along with the international NGO um, federation associations. And there has been a list of, a list of uh, referent, uh, I mean, recommendations, issues that has been handed over to the government, but still we need to work very seriously, closely, and very strategically on these issues. So maybe our friends can also share on this. At the same time, um, <clears throat> education network, the campaign for, national campaign for education, has also been proactively working on how can we uh, we reach most of the people, how can the education be one of the major um, strategies to bring people together, bring people act upon, and also not to interrupt any school. School for children, school for youth, and also education for all the community. How can this be? one of the uh, priority strategy of the government, they, we have been working together. There's so many other networks who've been working on to advocate the government to focus on the priority issues to address the crisis, socio-economic and, and other crisis that is being created by this COVID-19. So, so we would like, I would like our friends to think on and share on this. Now I would like to hand it over to Anthony. Anthony, please.
Sure. I think um, I think Sarita said she's uh, available. We want to go back to Sarita and see if that works. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me now? Hello. Yes. Hello. Hello. Yes, we can yes, hear we you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, thank you, Eileen, for this opportunity. Um, regarding my sharing of GBV, I think uh, everyone's concern the, uh, is um, uh, towards gender-based violence because as we go further in the lockdowns, the food scarcity, the movement, everything is uh, uh, really dragging us uh, towards um, more have-nots, let's say. In the sense, the rural economy was uh, remittance-based. Now, the products are in the field. So, gender-based violence will be more manifested in different forms because of the one will be from the workload that every uh, woman have to go through. And then the food. The food that inside the kitchen is always the role of a woman. And when even if we take an example of um, saving credit groups, bringing in money, most of it used to go to the kitchen. So, and even the new challenge is coming, how the loan repayment is being challenged, the micrograder that's going around. So gender-based manifestation, along with the men having no work, the increase of alcohol and the demand it may not be so high, but the desire for the better food, better security, and better care is always there, the overload for women. So gender violence manifestation is increasing. However, from the positive side, I think there is the protection cluster, the collective action uh, under the ministry is a remarkable steps. There are few posters that in Nepal, the Nepal police has uh, sh uh, shared, which can be availed if uh, if you are uh, going to share, but mechanisms are set, uh, processes to address GBV and domestic violence um, are pretty much sound than what I used to think would have been raised. That's all because I think we have much more time for discussion and much more inputs from colleagues waiting and thank you for the opportunity. I'm done. Salonidi, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Uh, uh, and please be with me for any information you want. Very I'll be kind. very more than happy to share. Sorry? Uh, are you waiting for me? I thought... Okay, um, I are you there? Are you uh, having trouble with your yeah. microphone? Hello? Okay, Saloni, are you there? Yes, I am very okay. much here. Okay. Um, so if, if Anthony is getting some problem with the microphone, Shall we open the floor for uh, for friends if they have any specific issue or anything that they want to share? Just raise your hand. And Eileen, please look at it. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm watching now. I'm seeing Charles. You have a question. You would like to make an intervention. Go ahead, Charles. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have small. Um, observation and appreciative inquiry. The point here is at this stage for disease uh, spreading, everyone is vulnerable. Everyone is vulnerable. Number two, we at this stage, uh, government is totally uh, locked down. We are in the very uh, physical distancing and we don't know what will happen in future for coming two or three weeks. Second, and this situation, and we have a, a good problem, a good issue is we have a mobile, Facebook, a lot of issue coming in this with this uh, mobile technology. Even uh, rural community or urban community, we are very connected. But the point is, 
I have not seen civil society organization, NGO, INGOs, and Federation Alliance kind of innovative ideas and uh, coming with uh, pushing government and alliance, mm -hmm. wo alliance working in their stage is missing. Uh, this is my observation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charles. I'm going to go next. I'm going to put you back on mute and I'm going to go next to Sakila. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sakila. And uh, I just want to talk about a few things. Like Nepal situation is very confusing because, because just a few weeks back, we didn't have any case. Now the cases are emerging and it's already reached 42 cases. So the problem, the level of problem, the scale of problem is really hard to identify. First thing is that because, because as I told you earlier, there were no cases. And uh, it seems that, that, that we lack um, sufficient number of diagnostic kits, maybe uh, let's say RDT, PCR, whatever you call it, but I definitely think that we lack sufficient number of diagnostic kits and uh, and diagnosis is not being done properly, uh, let's say in all provinces. Uh, the first thing is that. And um, regarding the second thing, um, as Charles said, like it's not the proper time to just focus on GBV because because now we should be thinking about all human beings and especially vulnerable communities. Because if you see Nepal's situation, then there are a lot of vulnerable communities, like we just talked about daily waste laborers who are definitely struggling a lot. And even they are not getting, um, let's say, not, not to say proper food, but they are not getting food at all. So these people definitely want to go back to their hometown. And the thing is that they are not getting, let's say, proper transportation means to go back to their hometown and get united with their family members. So this is another problem. And, and the third problem is with food security. And I would say that, I would say that in Nepal, situation, a lot of people are engaged in agriculture and their work is totally disturbed now. So there is a kind of, kind of, let's say, a, a baseless fear that people should not be going to their work, people should not be going to their fields. So uh, first, we should try to, by using, by mobilizing youths or by mobilizing local government units, we should be helping them out um, so as to produce sufficient number of food products. So uh, this is this is definitely needed in order to uh, in order to think about food security ahead also, not just during this time, but ahead also because because we cannot be just dependent on on imports. Um, so another concern is about children. Um, you can see that in this lockdown period, um, let's say, uh, our uh, are at home and, and doing no studies at all. And even if we try to pass from facilities um, from out of, out, out of Kathmandu. So um, this is this problem that um, communication problems regarding communication problems regarding food security problems regarding livelihood of people because the news coming is that um, people are patients are being uh, mm -hmm. yes can you hear me Sorry. now yeah yes. Sakila, you were breaking up a little bit I'm going the your I know that your 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 main intervention there at the end was to also be focusing in on children um, and, mm -hmm. and thinking about food security um, mm -hmm. was there was there a final point that you wanted to make Yes, um, my final point uh, here would be that um, uh, regarding because because you left that uh, that undiscussed regarding public policy discussion because right. uh, what I think is that this total lockdown is is ineffective ineffective um, I would say why because because we have to prioritize the areas so uh, the areas that we that we need to lock down like like where there are public gatherings those things need to be locked down 
but regarding other areas in order to to in order to let's say distribute food in order to distribute let's say a lot of basic things why don't we we let's say let people um move let's say be mobile be more mobile in terms of in terms of not having total lockdown so i would be totally against this total lockdown let's prioritize the areas let's prioritize and and uh, deal it with it um let's say level wise so as mm -hmm. as other countries have done so okay. to the government to the government we would say, we would like to say that um they they have to make some some changes regarding total lockdown because this is this is going terrible uh, and and this total lockdown is until until 27th april and uh, what will happen after 27th april it's still undecided so we have this is the right time that we tell the government uh, to use some rationality um, during this time okay thank you thank you very much sakila those are um, really good points and you know just based on um, you know, other experiences globally, including here in Canada. We've been in lockdown now since, I wouldn't call it a full lockdown, but we are definitely at home and, uh, and we have emergency um, systems in place in Canada across the country in terms of um, ability to move around, where you're allowed to go, where you're not allowed to go, the number of people that are allowed to gather. Um, and those have been, I think, um, those have been critical in order for us to to keep numbers down and not to over um, overstretch our healthcare systems. And I think that's a big issue. Is you know what's the appropriate level, as you've said here? What's the appropriate level of locking down um, when food security is such an issue um, and when people just don't have any resources to rely on? I'm going to turn over to Mikesh now and ask Mikesh if he. Uh, if, you, if you'd like to make your intervention, and then I see there's uh, another hand up after that. Thank you, Elin. Uh, I just wanted to bring this in. I think Sakila was also mentioning that, of course, uh, lockdown, complete lockdown is making lots of difficulty in terms of people's lives, economy, right? But at the same time, social distancing is one of the crucial steps at this moment. Uh, because we have also lesson learned from many countries where lockdown was not imposed and the case has escalated. The reason I'm saying this, the study case that uh, 12 case added study was asymptomatic, which is way more dangerous than the symptomatic cases. So in asymptomatic cases that we don't know whether I am infected or other... Wait, sir, I, your, your point is so valid. Sorry, yeah. So... Can I complete? Sorry. Yes, Sakila, thank you. So with this asymptomatic cases, I think at this moment, the biggest challenge with the government of Nepal is the quality of test and the expansion of the test. Is. I think in many countries, the test has been gone far away. I think in thousands and under thousands in Nepal, we have around 25,000. I think probably need to really pay attention on the, uh, the quality of uh, basically this rapid test and at the same time also try to expand as more as possible because with asymptomatic cases, it's very difficult to maintain this kind of uh, chain, uh, to break the chain. I mean. So this is one of the key concerns. I think social distancing is important, lockdown is important, but to what extent people at this moment, people are thinking that there is not many cases in Nepal, there is no death and so on. But I think we have to be prepared for the future and try to have some sort of balanced approach uh, advocating to government to increase the quality of uh, uh, their test and expansion of the test. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, you know, again, um, just having, you know, maybe with Canada being a bit further along the, the curve here, it's, it's useful to take a look at um, the state of things um, in your country in relation to numbers and look how quickly things have escalated and others just to, to compare. Um, Rupa, you also wanted to um, make an intervention. Um, can I let you, I'm gonna, uh, yeah, you should be able to access the mic now. Can you hear me? Hello, can, can you hear can, me? Yeah, you yes. have to speak yes. a little louder yes. towards your mic. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. thank you. Okay, uh, I would like to add some points uh, which Mukesh sir has already explained. The main thing is the testing, tracking, and tracing. And what we are lacking is we are not having sufficient samples collected and tested. 
and the number of cases are increasing day by day. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. I'm going, I'm going to see if, if anybody else is not speaking, if you could please put your, your mics on mute. Please carry on. And to add on the uh, effect of COVID-19 and its impact in uh, our daily lives, the one thing we are missing is about the mental health. The, those people who are working as a frontline health workers and all those people who are staying at home, they are, everyone is facing a kind of depression, anxiety, and this mental health is less focused. And I would like to share my experience. Uh, I recently have delivered uh, a baby and hot in April. And as a mother, uh, for the first time, I was scared to go to the health facility to have delivery. Because uh, there may be a COVID-19 patient, someone who is infected, and I was scared that I may be infected or my newborn baby will be infected. Yeah, that's um, Rupa, congratulations. People are also saying congratulations in the chat. Um, and Thank congratulations you. in a very uh, a very difficult time um, to be having a newborn, um, which uh, you know obviously you, not only do you need to protect yourself, but you also need to protect uh, the most vulnerable, which include um, small children. Yeah, like that. you won't believe I was in severe anxiety and depression before the delivery because I was very concerned what will happen if anyone is infected, what will happen to me and my baby. Finally, everything is right and we are fine, but I would like to share my experience uh, while I was in post-operative war. We hear that uh, there's a suspected COVID-19 patient being operated and so we'll be here soon in post-operative war. We'll be sharing the same room. I was so scared that I requested to shift me in the cabin and uh, they allowed me to go to the cabin, but just imagine uh, how terrible the situation is. Mm -hmm. Very, very much so. Um, you know, Ripa has raised a, a very important point, and it's one again that we're seeing um, globally around um, considerations around mental health, in addition to everything else that we're facing. Um, so it's an excellent uh, it's an excellent intervention to also raise, um, and particularly for those um, that need extra supports um, like you have needed, Rupa. Um, I'm just taking a look at the list of attendees, and I'm not seeing anybody with a raised hand. Was there anybody else that wanted to add something to the conversation we're having right now? I'd like to also. Um, suggest that we take a, take a few minutes to think about um, the various uh, questions that have been put up on the screen over the last, uh, over the last several uh, minutes. Um, you know, there were questions around looking at the most vulnerable. Uh, there were questions around livelihoods implications. There's questions around what we can be doing in terms of advocacy um, to policymakers and some of your your suggested comments have, have also come into that. What is it that we think um, in terms of next steps that, um, what, what is the value we think here of, of, of this group um, and all of you coming from different organizational backgrounds, from different positions? Um, clearly the, the, the larger group of, uh, of alumni, if you will, um, Cody, uh, Cody alumni being over 200. Is there an opportunity here for um, a more detailed conversation? Uh, are there things that we need to be thinking about, um, not just in the moment that we're in right now, which is this current lockdown moment, but what happens when we start to, to ease up on that lockdown and we, and we start to reintegrate uh, and, and, and resume activities? Um, I think it's been really made quite clear in, in the Canadian context, and, and perhaps this will also come to light in the, in the Nepalese context, that it will not be business as usual. It is not going to go back to the previous normal, if you will. So now that we have a new normal, what is it that our organizations need to be doing to, to adjust and to respond? 
And I would like to know if anybody has any comments and then also ask Saloni for her inputs. Anthony is typing in here um, in, his, uh, in the messages, and I'm just taking a look at others, that regarding livelihoods, there's multiple examples right now of you know, women's groups that are seizing the moment and producing face masks. So in, the, you know, in, this, in this moment of time, there's a lot of innovation that is happening that I think it's really important that we are acknowledging, that we're, um, that we're celebrating, and that we're also looking at in terms of the way that we might move forward. Other comments that are coming up here is the, the fact that we, when we're talking about the most vulnerable, and this was a point raised, uh, I think, in one of, by one of the panel, uh, one of the attendees earlier that we need to also be thinking about those that are, are you know, persons with disability, um, the the LGBTQ community, and and the extra stress that is placed upon them. The the a whole area of, uh, of water and sanitation, um, uh, the wash sector is uh, is also a major sector that's responding right now in Nepal to the COVID. Um, and then there's the access to medication, um, another another challenge that's continuing on. So, are there other? Is there other um, other comments? Would people like to raise their hands? And maybe Saloni, I would start with you. Is there anything? And Saran, would, is there anything that you would like to add to this? Saloni, you are muted. I've just unmuted yeah. you, Saloni. Do you want to go ahead? And Saran as well, either one of you. Okay, let me give it to Suran first. Let Suran speak first. Okay, so, uh, you know, as of now, the whole country is, uh, as some others are saying uh, as well, it's, it's confused. We are, we are in a state of, you know, confusion where we could not even sometimes decide what to do, whether to follow the uh, lockdown or whether to take any other action to, uh, is the lives lives of the people. So um, I think uh, we need to see whatever is the response in the two phase. So one is up to the phase where uh, where where disease uh, is very very much uh, rising, and one another phase when when the when the situation goes to the normal. So again, as as you guys are saying, the new normal won't be the same as now. So I think. Uh, the whole response in terms of the you know economy uh, whole whole response plan in terms of the strengthening the, our support system in the health uh, wash and livelihood sectors and then um, mental health issues of course followed by uh, education strengthening so we need to come up with the different initiative and different plans uh, and again it's not necessarily we can decide or we can talk uh, not right now about you know being a good alumni in Nepal. How can we move ahead? But at least to share what we are doing uh, in these two different scenarios from our own organization or our own involvement, so that in coming days any potential collaboration or any uh, potential information sharing that we can do as an alumni, uh, we can do and we can uh, establish better coordination in response plan. Uh, one of the key thing that uh, that I anticipate, as Rupa was uh, saying about, you know, the volunteers um, movement, or at least this National Youth Council has already collected potential youth volunteers. I think uh, another important aspect for uplifting the economy in coming days is actually contributing from every citizens in our own context. You know, where where our principles. Uh, studying in Kodi also uh, you know, highlighted more, how can we contribute little more than before to uplift uh, the entire economy? And of course, it won't be uh, completed within a few days or a month, but we need to continuously work on it. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things um, that exists here um, in Canada is um, um, an organization which brings together the the entire sector working on um, international development issues. Um, and we've seen a lot of um, coordinated dis conversation and discussion. Does something like that also exist in Nepal? Um, so for example, amongst all of you, are your organizations already convening conversations and spaces or uh, and opportunities for collaboration?
Is this, this a question for everyone? This is a question for you, for anybody, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know um, the extent to which um, civil society or, you know, community, uh, community focused organizations uh, have any kind of coordinated uh, conversations or responses right now. I, I can talk about uh, what at least uh, my organization or, you know, I am involved so far. So I think uh, in the very beginning of lockdown, everyone was uh, anticipating not for a longer days. And then, you know, there wasn't really a long uh, proper coordination in the beginning. But I think uh, as of now, a lot of uh, civil society organizations have started uh, communicating, have started actually developing the plan uh, potentially uh, for two sectors, non-health and health. So I think uh, it has been, uh, there has been a lot of plans initiated. Some are already uh, implemented, but uh, most of the civil society's contributions are uh, skewed toward the after COVID uh, situations in Nepal. And I think that's also a key part because not everyone uh, can actually act right now because First, not everyone uh, have the emergency response background, and again, not everyone uh, have the health background. So I think, uh, depending upon the organizations, uh, people now have started uh, use coordination in different clusters, but we still need to see the result in coming days. Great, and I see that Rupa has her hand up. Um, Rupa, could I ask you to uh, say what you wanted to say? Uh, okay. I'm just like uh, continuing with the student, just like civil society also, you know, as a youth group also doing so far, uh, just like regarding the gender and then like mentoring hygiene and other issues. Uh, like uh, I'm also belong to the civil society part. So as a one of the platform, we are also thinking to, you know, give, provide like uh, with the relief, some of mentoring until hygiene kids and some post, you know, maternal thing. So we are thinking that we also, and then civil society group, youth group has also formed the emergency rescue team. So they all are trying to help each other, you know, moral and then mental health support and sharing their experience experiences from the community to national level. And another hand, I'm just, so this is uh, this my queries and questions or like uh, opinion for all of us uh, today we discuss uh, you know different areas like government should do this or that and then we feel like government is also not sufficient or efficient and what will be the next one or like post con uh, post like uh, uh, covid uh, responses by the government so can we also you know uh, think uh, or like uh, give some suggestions or make some you know uh, letter of uh, alter, uh, some you know uh, proposed uh, agenda towards go uh, government and um, maybe the digit uh, through the uh, digital or some some you know uh, through some media we can hand over those to uh, through uh, to government and another uh, and on next plan is that I. I was participate some of MPs one to meeting. They were also thinking uh, this COVID can be give us like next opportunity also because like we have a fertile land and then since long we are not too, uh, too much you know having proper use and then production. So maybe the our youth or whoever come back home can uh, you know bring or like utilize those next opportunity to uplift the our situation. Uh, and then, but like definitely government has to be very efficient to address or brought up those, all the plans and investment in coming days. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rupa. Um, I'm seeing some other great um, uh, uh, points that have been put into the chat as well, um, including, um, you know, some, some considerations from Charles, who, who says that in the coming days, there's, um, you know, there's at least three or four different points of, of intervention that need to happen. Um, and, you know, all of this speaks to the fact that another comment that was raised by Sarita is that a multidisciplinary approach is required for collaboration. And, um, and you know, that could include, um, you know, to build on where Charles is coming from, start, you know, thinking about livelihoods, thinking about food production and security, food security, 
thinking about how do we re-engage with livelihood activities. Um, and, you know, and then how do, again, how do we regain our energy to, re to reestablish the resilience? You know, Nepal, I know, is, is uh, already such a resilient um, country and its communities are, have already faced many other challenges. Um, Anthony's made a point here is whether this, whether the pandemic is like other humanitarian crises that you may have faced in the past, or whether this is fundamentally different and needs a different model. Clearly, one of the things that's preoccupying um, all countries right now is the extent to which this pandemic could see itself return for a second or, you know, or, or second wave or beyond that, and whether that second wave would be worse than the first. So clearly, um, you know, some of that thinking is built in. The, the unknowns are there, but the, um, the community responses to crisis moments like you've had in the past in Nepal um, have all also been very strong. So what is it that's possible? Um, I think that I got Anthony back on the call. I'm not sure if he's able to join again, um, but I think since the time is already um, quite advanced, I'm going to suggest that Anthony and uh, Saloni wrap up and we talk about how we might want to connect again in the future if that's of interest to all of you. Um, Saloni, I turn it to you and Anthony if you're able. All right, can you hear me? Let me... I can hear you now. Yes. That's great. All Please right. Take all right. Well, thank you very much. Sorry for my absence, and uh, and I appreciate Eileen filling in. She she volunteered to be tech support, and she ended up being co-facilitator. So uh, it's the nature of uh, resilience, I think, and and women's multitasking. So thanks for that. Um, yeah. So I, I basically I just want to thank everybody who's uh, who's uh, um, participated. Uh, a lot of ideas put on the table. And Nepal is in a very interesting situation. I mean, you have a whole history of dealing with humanitarian crises. I mean, the uh, almost annual flooding and, and landslide issues, and then more catastrophic ones like the uh, like the earthquake of a few years ago. Um, but this one is seems to be fundamentally different, and uh, both in terms of its nature and and how it spread over time and geography. So I think it is going to require uh, some really um, innovative and creative thinking. And it's great to hear that uh, amongst Cody uh, graduates that this is already uh, starting as you try to figure out what is the best way uh, forward. What's not clear from our perspective, I, I will say it at the Cody, where as, as a place where we do a lot of thinking and work around development practice, of course, is whether um, this is whether the COVID-19 um, crisis is a uh, transformative moment. Uh, for the uh, for the development sector and maybe for our societies more fundamentally, uh, the case is being made very strong in strongly in Europe and uh, and North America that uh, the pandemic uh, is reflecting and exacerbating uh, the fundamental inequalities in our society and the uh, the the failings of um, of a government policy for a generation in terms of. Um, not uh, dealing e effectively or efficiently with um, investing in social sectors, including health education, and most importantly, leaving people vulnerable in terms of uh, livelihoods, housing, and, and so forth. So um, there's uh, there, there, there are some really big questions there, which we, of course, are all mulling over as we try to deal with the day-to-day -day realities of responding to what's actually happening in our communities at the moment. And for some of us, that's a health crisis. And for some of us, that's a livelihoods crisis. And for, um, uh, for others, it's a, uh, it's a crisis of violence. Um, and in many cases, it's an overlapping or an interplay of all of those. So um, I would just like to thank you all very much. Um, I, I do want to uh, underline that there will be uh, some, um, uh, some follow-up. Uh, we will, um, this is being recorded. We will post the recording. Um, we will um, share the, um, uh, the PowerPoint um, and we will be writing up some notes on this. Uh, this is the first national conversation we've had. I mean, um, so uh, as always, Nepal leads uh, when it comes to relations with Cody, but we have other ones in the pipeline and we will build on that and we will try to move that forward. So from our perspective, we're gonna move forward these conversations 
but I now want to hand over to Saloni is in case there's something in particular that you would like to think about in terms of um, uh, follow-up or activities or whatever um, in Nepal itself. Thank you very much, Anthony. Uh, I would like to join you to acknowledge everyone who contributed by uh, speaking out and also by participating here. There are some of our friends who've been listening and also contributing this. So listening everyone and, and, and just capturing the major thing is now we are coming back to the basics. So it's, it's bringing me back to my days in, at Cody and specifically Anthony, your class, when we talk, talked about community economics. You know, now the fundamental thing, we're coming back to the basics. We had a big circle and we are back into the circle. So it's, we now, uh, every one of us are saying that we have to have a holistic, multidisciplinary, approach of addressing this issue uh, not one specific or not only economic activities or not only health activities or not only the political policy activities it has to be very coordinated consolidated and it should be uh, it should be included everyone's concerns this is what we're saying that even within the vulnerability, there are multiple different types of vulnerable people who we should not leave them. Uh, like, and even with the problem, with the pandemic, with the crisis, we, all of us are seeing lots of hope and opportunities. Like in, in the case of Nepal, yes, we have had earthquake very recently. We have had we are still having a huge lot of political change, a very young recent federal state which is trying to establish its own uh, federalism within our state, uh, very young. So we, if we are smart enough, if we can all work together, if we can think and take this as an opportunity, we, need, we, we should mobilize this, we should use this as an opportunity because federal states now are responding. Now, it, it still, till last month, we said that there are different federal, uh, federal, I mean, state, I mean, federal governments in place. Local governments need to address their own issues. It was not up to the level. Now, when it became the lockdown, now, even the communities, even the local governments are now responding there either by restricting people coming from outside or supporting their own own people. So we we are envisaging that there will be almost two million young young human resources coming back. So we can use them we can mobilize them, we can take them as a huge big resource of the country. And the fallow lands that has been left for years in the country can be used. Therefore, uh, I see lots of opportunity. At the same time, a huge big challenge because we, we have not been together. It has not been a consolidated, um, holistic, multidisciplinary approach. So. The main thing is now we, uh, we identified the uh, problem and we also identified some of, us, identified some of the uh, potential resources. All we need to do is we need to sit together again and again and also learn, discuss, interact, and see how can we work together, how can we address the issue with the appropriate strategy. Therefore, I would like to request all the friends and also Cody uh, that we, we, we organize some follow-up events. Let's be in touch together, maybe by the common uh, email, whatever way we need, we, we should talk together, we should be updating each other and, and we should also be supporting it, each other. May it be by, by giving inputs, may it be by sharing the resources, or may it be by raising the collective voice uh, 
to to the uh, for the public uh, policy change. So I would like to um, uh, for all all of us, it is a it is really a very big uh, opportunity. After three four weeks of silence, we've been here together and discuss. Thank you very much, Anthony, Eileen, and all the Kodi group, and also all our friends. Suran, thank you very much. Rupa, um, <clears throat> um, Rupa, and other um, friends who prepared a little bit more case. Rupa, um, and others who ever contributed. I, I don't, um, I think uh, we all heard from them. And I also look, I would like to thank all other friends who've been silently participating here and also have been uh, giving their inputs in the chat box. Thank you very much. And Eileen, I, I, I suppose, I, I, I guess you are also taking the notes and, and the team will, um, are documenting this. So we hope to come back to this group again. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for uh, being together. Thank you for supporting each other. And we also would like to con congratulate uh, collectively to Rup Rupa, who just had a new baby, and also Suran. I think both of you had new baby in April. So congratulations. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations to all the group for being able to be together and share. Thank you. Thank Namaste. you, everyone.